Welcome to Cosmological Investigations. I'm Josh Rasmussen, a professor of philosophy. And my goal in this video course is to survey cosmological arguments. I'm thinking of cosmological arguments as a tool for investigating ultimate reality. My goal is to go deep, and I want to see if we can uncover the deepest possible explanation of everything. This video course has six parts. In this first video, I'm going to provide a general overview into this type of inquiry. And then in subsequent videos, I'm going to provide particular examples of cosmological arguments. In the final video, I'm going to give you my own cosmological argument and present my latest thinking on this topic. Before we get into this inquiry, I want to share a little bit about my own journey of thinking about this topic. As I think about my journey, I see five stages that it divides into. I'm going to just point to these very briefly. The first stage happened when I was a senior in high school and I had a worldview crisis. This was when I began to question some of the basic beliefs that I had about reality. One of my beliefs was that reality was fundamentally good and that this fundamental goodness was the ultimate cause of our universe. But this belief that I had came into question as I had conversations with others who had different beliefs. And I realized that my reasons in support of my belief didn't seem to withstand scrutiny. And so I really wanted to find out, okay, well, what's actually true? I can't just adopt a viewpoint that I have inherited because other people have had different viewpoints. As I began to think about these different perspectives, I became very curious to seek and to find out more about the nature of things. And this led to a quest. In this quest, I began to read books by philosophers who've thought a lot about these questions. I remember going to the library and picking out books by atheist philosophers. I was curious to understand these things in my own terms. And this led to the stage that I call worldview development. Through reading these books, I began to see some ways of investigating things. And in particular, thinking about the cosmological argument, which we'll be discussing, this was something that I really focused on. Now, this third stage really doesn't have a conclusion because as a philosopher, I'm continuing to develop my worldview. But in thinking about cosmological arguments in particular, I went from just developing my own view personally to I, be, I began to contribute to the field of philosophy. And if you know my work, you know that I've published various articles and books on this topic of cosmological arguments. And so I'm very excited to share some of my research as well as some thoughts I've been having more recently that I have not yet published anywhere. And then finally, in my current stage, I have a great desire to serve you guys who are leaders in ideas. And I want to serve you by giving you tools that you can use to think about these things for yourself. All right, so let's jump back into the inquiry. The inquiry really is about existence, and I want to talk about a puzzle of existence. The puzzle begins with this question, this basic question. Why is there anything at all? Why not just nothing? This is the kind of question that can sort of startle you if you think about it at night when the familiar becomes unfamiliar and you just think about, okay, things exist, but why? Why is there really anything? You know, couldn't you just imagine, like imagine if reality were just blank or just nothing. When I think about this sort of question, I imagine subtracting the things that exist, subtract out the planets, the people, the particles, there's just empty space. And if you can imagine this, just subtract out the space as well, then there's just nothing, just nothing. And yet there's actually something. And this existence that we find ourselves in is so familiar but just because something is familiar doesn't mean that it's insignificant things exist but the fact that things exist is far from insignificant why do things exist when i think about this question this basic question of existence it can really startle me there have been these moments where i thought you know it's so strange that something exists that if i didn't know better I would think there was nothing because like, how could there be anything? Now, if you're not really bothered by this question, hold on a minute because I'm going to draw out a puzzle and this puzzle is going to create a bit of a tension for us to help us think more about the nature of reality. 
But first, I want to just highlight a few things that I think are at stake. First, thinking about why there's anything can help us to understand the total structure of reality. This structure of reality allows us to make predictions in science and in ordinary experience. Thinking about why anything exists at all can help us to see and understand the nature of this structure of reality. Also, the question about existence can help us to understand the fundamental nature of reality, as we shall see. And then finally, as you may anticipate, thinking about cosmological arguments will help us to investigate the nature and the existence of a supreme being or God. Now, for the purposes of this inquiry, I'm not going to assume that God exists. And I'm not going to assume anything about God if God does exist. I really want this to be a fresh inquiry where we just look with new eyes at the ultimate questions of existence. So that's what I'm going to be doing in this video series. I've added a note here for leaders. I want to say that your work on this can help build a city of understanding. Because the work to understand the nature of reality, it's not a complete work. It's a work that can continue to develop. And we all need each other to build new structures, to see new things, and to have an increasingly beautiful understanding of things. So I want to just say this here because sometimes when discussing arguments, there can be a kind of finality to a certain presentation. Like this is the argument, it's either sound or it's debunked and it's not sound. In either case, there's almost kind of a barrier to progress. And my whole goal is to present the arguments and the considerations as a way of stimulating progress for leaders who are working to build a greater understanding of ultimate reality. And I really believe that the cosmological argument can help us do that. And that's why we're going to take some time to see what cosmological arguments are and how they can work. Okay, now let's come back to this puzzle of existence. I'm going to draw out not just a puzzle, not just a mystery, not just a paradox, but a contradiction from thinking about existence. Here's how this works. I begin with a principle based on widespread observation. The principle is what I call universal causation. Everything comes from or is caused by something else. Why I think this is true? Well, by observation, when I see things, I see that they come from other things. Leaves come from trees. Trees come from seeds. Those seeds come from prior states. Everything that we observe seems to come from something else. This isn't just based on observation. This seems to be based on reason. Take something even that you've never observed. Imagine, for example, some blue sphere out in outer space. If there were such a blue sphere, I imagine that you would think that that came from something. It didn't just exist on its own from nothing. Because everything comes from something. This seems to be a basic principle of reality. But here's another principle. The principle of uncaused existence. Reality in total. Okay, all of it together comes not from something, but from nothing. And when I say it comes from nothing, I don't mean there is this something called nothing which produced reality. I just mean that reality in its totality, no matter what its size, no matter what its shape, did not come from something beyond itself. It couldn't have because there's nothing beyond all of reality. It would be a logical contradiction for there to be something real that's outside of all reality. There's nothing real outside all of reality. So if there is a reality, then that reality in its totality did not come from anything. Yet this contradicts the principle of universal causation, that everything comes from something. So we have two principles that can't both be true. The second principle, the principle of uncaused existence, seems to be verified by reason itself. It's by reason that we can see that there's nothing beyond everything. Reality in total can't come from anything. But by universal observation, it seems like everything comes from something. How can we resolve the contradiction? So let's have a closer look at this puzzle by considering three responses that don't work. The goal of these responses is to clarify the nature of this puzzle. So the first response somebody might have is to say, well, maybe there's an infinite chain of explanations. So maybe the way this works is that everything does come from something else. It's like an infinite chain of dominoes where each thing comes from a prior thing. There's no contradiction in that. 
But actually, there's still a problem because we haven't yet explained the whole chain. It's not just individual things that come from other things. Entire chains come from other things. And if a chain is infinite and we say that the infinite chain doesn't come from anything, well, then that would be a counterexample to the general principle that everything comes from something. William Rowe, in his book on the cosmological argument, he gives the example of an eternal star. He says that if there were a star that were eternally giving off light, then from all of eternity, light would be dependent on something prior to its existence, namely the star, even though there's always been light. Because even if there's always been light, as long as there's also always been a source of that light, then that light has a deeper explanation in terms of its source, the star. Of course, we can ask, what explains the existence of the star? If the eternal light has some prior cause or some prior source, then what's the prior cause or the prior source of the eternal star? The principle of explanation or causation is the principle that each thing that exists has some further cause or explanation in terms of something else. And it doesn't help if there's infinitely many things that are lined up in a chain, an infinite chain of causes, because we can ask about the chains, the infinite chains, what caused them. Another example that can illustrate this general problem comes from Leibniz. He talks about geometry books being copied from other geometry books. Imagine that each geometry book is copied from a prior geometry book all the way out to infinity, so there's no first geometry book. Well, Leibniz invites us to consider why are there ever any geometry books at all? It seems like merely having infinitely many geometry books linked up in this chain doesn't thereby explain the entire chain itself. Now, maybe you think an infinite chain wouldn't have a further explanation, and maybe there's a way of motivating that. But my point here is just that merely having an infinite chain isn't by itself enough to get us out of this paradox, because Merely multiplying something out to infinity doesn't by itself account for how that could just exist on its own without an explanation. It seems like if there were an eternal star, an infinitely blue ball, a chain of chickens producing other chickens, a chain of geometry books being copied from other geometry books, each of those things seem like they would call for some further explanation. And it seems like a further explanation would be possible, at least conceivable, one could conceive, for example, in the case of the star, of an eternal star producing eternal light. And then one could conceive of something producing or sustaining that eternal star within existence. And so on. And so if we really want to get to an ultimate explanation of things, it seems like we need some, some sort of relevant difference to explain how something can exist uncaused and unexplained. But that's the very puzzle of existence. How could anything exist uncaused and unexplained. Whether it's finite or infinite, it may seem that it should have some further explanation. Another kind of response that I sometimes hear is that the whole puzzle assumes that the universe is a thing. But then people say, maybe the universe is not actually a thing. Instead, the universe is just a bunch of things. It's many things. But it's not in addition to those many things, a single thing that needs to be explained. My response, however, is that even if the universe isn't a thing, we can still wonder what explains the things, the many. The point here is that the principle of a causal order of things coming from other things applies not just to individuals, to individual balls or to individual persons, but also implies to plurals, to groups, to many. It's not like it's easier for a flock of birds to appear from nothing than for a single bird to appear from nothing. You know, it's kind of like in the infinity case, merely adding more things doesn't thereby remove the mystery of why there are those things. Whether there's one thing or infinitely many, whether the universe is a thing or it's many things, the mystery still remains as to what explains its existence. And so I don't think that we really get to the root of this mystery. I don't think we really resolve it just by analyzing the universe as many things. A third idea that you might anticipate me suggesting is that maybe God somehow explains existence. Maybe there's a supreme being, and this being has so much power that it could produce an entire reality from nothing. However, I do not recommend this response. 
you might anticipate what I'm going to say. The problem is that if God exists and God explains existence, then God somehow explains his own existence. But how is that even possible? How could anything explain its own existence? The fundamental problem here is captured by a familiar question. What explains God? Now, maybe there's some way of motivating a special exception here. Maybe there's a way of understanding God so we can see why God would be the kind of being that doesn't have a further explanation. But then we need that special motivation. We need to see what that would be because otherwise, we might as well just say that chickens or the universe or your own current experiences are unexplained and uncaused. If there's some being that explains existence, then does that being exist? If that being exists, then that would mean that it somehow explains its own existence. But the whole problem is that things don't explain their own existence. Things seem to come from other things. That's part of our universal observation. At this stage in our inquiry, none of these responses really get to the heart of the puzzle. And so, if we are to understand why anything exists at all, we're going to have to go deeper. We're going to have to go beyond these responses. This is precisely where the cosmological argument comes in. The picture here shows the general structure of reality that the cosmological argument seeks to uncover. The general cosmological argument, it seeks to show that dependent things, things that come from other things, things like trees, like planets, like people, things that they don't, they don't exist on their own, they exist because of other things. Those things depend ultimately on something independent, some independent part of reality that is also a special part of reality because it's able to exist without depending on other things. Now, cosmological arguments can come into two stages. In the first stage, this is the foundation stage, this stage seeks to show that dependent things depend on some foundational independent reality. The second stage, sometimes called the identification stage, seeks to show that this foundational reality is special or even supreme, has a kind of supreme nature. So it's because of this second stage that the cosmological argument is often associated with an argument for the existence of a supreme being or God. And we'll be looking at both stages of the argument in quite some detail. Now, in this introductory video, I just want to give you this basic overview of the structure of the argument. We'll be looking at specific versions of this argument in subsequent videos. Before I conclude this introduction, I want to point out three barriers that sometimes block people from even beginning this kind of inquiry. One barrier is an epistemological barrier. People worry that the question of existence is just too big. Or alternatively, we are just too small. We're too small, we're too finite, we're too limited to have any hope of getting any real answers to these questions. Now, my response is a gentle response. I just ask, how do we know? How do we know where the limits of reason lie? Now, if somebody's just worried that maybe we can't know something, that's fair, that's fair. But if if instead their worry turns into a kind of dogmatic assertion that we know that we cannot know ultimate reality, then I want to know how did they come to know that? If we are too small and too limited to be able to get answers to deep questions, then how do we know that we're so small and so limited? Really, when I think about it, it seems like if I really am so much in the dark, then I wouldn't even be able to know while I'm in the dark what I could know. In order to know what I could know, I'd have to have a certain amount of knowledge, a certain amount of light. So I want to suggest that instead of cutting off our inquiry too short, we go out and we just see what we can see. We'll just see where reason might lead us. There's also an important psychological worry. Sometimes people associate these kind of arguments with a kind of rationalization of their religion. The worry here is that if somebody's using an argument to rationalize some prior belief that they have, which isn't even based on that argument, then this can sort of call into question the reliability of that argument. It's sort of like a guilt by association. I have a lot of appreciation for this worry. My response is just to invite you to consider the argument. I don't think this argument has to be a rationalization of prior beliefs. For example, William Rowe in his book, he critically analyzed various cosmological arguments and then developed a particular argument which he said 
could provide theists with a reasonable justification of belief. William Rowe said this not to rationalize a religion, because he himself was not religious. He was agnostic. He didn't even believe in the existence of God. Yet he saw a particular version of the cosmological argument as providing some reason to think that God is real. And ultimately, if you are owning your own investigation, then it doesn't matter how anybody uses the argument. Really, what matters is how you use the argument, how you investigate reality. Finally, some people stay out of this investigation because they don't feel like they're equipped. They see a lot of controversy, and it sort of demotivates them from thinking that it's possible to have insight for themselves. Hopefully, this course can help you in a first-hand investigation so that you're not hidden behind clouds of controversy. And ultimately, the only way to really see what you can see is to try to see. See where the light of reason might lead you. The light of reason can help you see things for yourself. As a final note, and perhaps this is just obvious, it takes courage to investigate big questions where other people do not. I will now conclude this video by showing what's coming up in the next videos. In the steps ahead, we will examine the following topics. The Kalam Cosmological Argument. Contingency Arguments, Stage 1. Contingency Arguments, Stage 2 modal contingency arguments, and then my latest thoughts on my argument from arbitrary limits. So that's it for this first video. Thank you guys for your attention. If you have any particular questions or comments about this video, feel free to provide comments below. I look forward to connecting with you in the next presentation.